At age three, a young girl by the name of Jodie Miller was having terrible seizures, sometimes every three minutes. The left side of her body would just stop and she would collapse on that side. The doctors could do nothing to stop the seizures and were left with the option of completely removing the right hemisphere of her brain. And what it shows us is the fact that we in removed her entire right hemisphere. The right hemisphere that was there is now replaced by fluid. Amazingly, not only did she survive the surgery, but it also successfully stopped the seizures. But could she live and function with just half a brain? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're going to explore brain plasticity and functional recovery after trauma. At the end of the video, there'll be some practice questions of what we cover so that you can check your understanding. And link below is a free resource that goes with this video. In a previous video in the biopsychology series, we explored how the body communicates with itself, which included the structure and function of neurons, as well as the process of synaptic transmission. We're going to build on these ideas in this video so do go back and check that out first if you need to. Brain plasticity is the ability of the brain to modify its structure and function based on experience. You probably have some awareness of this idea. For example, children tend to have a more plastic brain in the sense that it can change and adapt more easily. In early development, the brain experiences a rapid growth in the number of synaptic connections. This makes it easier for young children to learn new things. It's often said that it's easier to learn to speak more than one language as a child, and this is because the brain is more plastic when you are younger. It was once thought by researchers that the ability for the brain to change and adapt only happened during childhood. However, more recent research, as we will later see, has shown how the brain can continue to change its structure and create new pathways throughout our lifetime, including older age. Crucial to the brain changing and adapting are life experiences. When we experience something new, nerve pathways in the brain develop, and as we experience these things again and again, the connections become stronger. In contrast, the less we use those nerve pathways, the less we have those experiences, the more likely they'll be pruned away. So what are some of these experiences that can change the brain's physical structure? Let's consider four pieces of psychological research to demonstrate this. Firstly, research by Kemperman et al. in 1997. In this study, they investigated how different environments would change the brains of rats. 24 rats were divided into two groups. In the control condition, 12 rats were placed in laboratory cages, 4 rats per cage. They received food and water as much as they wanted. In the experimental condition, the other 12 were placed in what the researchers called a complex environment. This larger space contained paper tubes, materials for making nests, plastic tubes, a tunnel, and of course, a running wheel. They received extra treats, including cheese, crackers, apple, and popcorn. What they found was that compared to the rats housed in lab cages, the rats who lived in the more complex environment showed an increase in the number of new neurons in their brains, notably in the hippocampus. This supports the view that the physical structure of the brain can change as a result of life experiences. However, you may be thinking that this research is rather limited because it's based on rats. Some have argued that there are substantial and significant differences between humans and rats in terms of the complexity of human behaviours and our experiences, notably in terms of language, social interaction and emotions. Therefore, this means we might need to be cautious about drawing firm conclusions about brain plasticity solely from animal research. So what about research into human brains? Well, secondly, let's consider research with London taxi drivers. Every licensed taxi driver in London has completed what has become known as the knowledge. This is a test about how well they can navigate around London. For those of you not familiar with London, here is a map of New York City. It's very easy to navigate as the streets are in a grid pattern. Vertical streets are called avenues, horizontal streets are given numbers. So if you get in a taxi in New York, you simply say 43rd and 5th Avenue. However, London looks a lot different. It looks like this. And the streets aren't numbered, but all have unique names like Oxford Street or Baker Street. Most people take at least two years to train for and complete the knowledge. Part of the test requires being assessed by an examiner who gives you two random points in London and you have to provide the shortest route entirely from memory. 
Eleanor Maguire and colleagues in 2000 conducted research on the brains of 16 right-handed male London taxi drivers with an average of 14 years' experience and compared them with 50 right-handed male non-taxi drivers. To do this, they scanned the brains of each participant using an MRI machine which provided an image of the structure of the brain. When they compared the images, they found that the London taxi drivers showed a larger posterior hippocampus compared to the control group. The word posterior meaning back, so the back of the hippocampus. They concluded, quote, It seems that there is a capacity for local plastic change in the structure of the healthy adult human brain in response to environmental demands. In other words, they suggested that this change in the structure of the hippocampus demonstrated brain plasticity. The taxi driver's experience of navigating the streets of London placed such a high demand on their spatial processing that the brain changed its structure. In fact, they found a positive correlation. The more time a participant had been a London taxi driver, the larger the size of the hippocampus. Thirdly, research into computer games. In this study, participants got to play Super Mario. Playing certain video games places demands on your cognitive and motor skills. You have to do multiple things at once, memorize the layout of maps and worlds, correctly use the buttons and joystick on the controller in just the right way, as well as think strategically about how to defeat the boss. Kuhn et al in 2014 compared a control group who played no video games with a video game group who were trained for two months on the game Super Mario, playing for at least 30 minutes per day. Two months later, when they scanned the brains of both groups in an MRI machine, they found a significant increase in grey matter in the prefrontal cortex, hippocampus and cerebellum. This increase was not seen in the control group who didn't play video games. The researchers concluded that the experience of playing video games had resulted in new synaptic connections in brain areas involved in spatial navigation, strategic planning, working memory and motor performance, all the skills needed to play the game successfully. Fourthly, and lastly, learning to play golf. Bazola et al. in 2012 studied 11 participants aged 40 to 60 years old who were all novices at golf. These novices then had 40 hours of golf practice and were compared with a control group matched in terms of age and sex who didn't have any golf training. They scanned the brains of the participants in both groups with an fMRI machine. In case you didn't know, an fMRI is different from an MRI because of the word functional. An MRI just takes an image of the structure of the brain, whereas an fMRI scans the brain whilst participants carry out a function or an activity, in this case a golf swing. They scanned their brains at the start of the study, and then again after the experimental group had completed their 40 hours of practice. The participants were instructed to imagine with their eyes closed their own golf swing from a first-person perspective and in slow motion. They found reduced activity in the motor cortex in the brain, the area responsible for movement. But hang on, why would you have reduced activity after learning a new skill? Surely you'd have more, right? Well, reduced activity in the brain suggests that the experience of playing golf had changed the structure of the brain. The repeated golf practice had refined the pathways in the brain for the golf swing. The brain had become more efficient in its neural pathways. The fact that the brain had changed its structure by becoming efficient is evidence of brain plasticity. All of these studies not only demonstrate brain plasticity, but also how it's not limited to children. Adult brains can still adapt and change based on life experiences, and as the last study by Bazola importantly demonstrates, brain plasticity is even possible in middle to older age people. Now that we've established the brain's ability to adapt and change due to experiences, we can now develop our exploration of brain plasticity into the area of functional recovery after trauma. Functional recovery is where the brain recovers abilities previously lost due to brain injury. Brain functions move from a damaged area to an undamaged area. A lesion is an area of the brain which has suffered damage through injury or disease. 
If someone has a lesion in the brain, this will lead to a loss of function. Let's consider the example of someone who has suffered a stroke. A stroke occurs when something blocks blood supply to part of the brain or when a blood vessel in the brain bursts. In either case, parts of the brain become damaged and as a result, they can lose some functions, such as their speech and movement, depending on where in the brain the stroke occurred. However, what researchers quickly discovered was that over time, the brain rewires itself so that some of the lost functions can be recovered. But the question became, how does the brain do this if the parts of the brain that carried out that function before are now damaged and can no longer be used? There are several different processes involved, but we're just going to consider three. Firstly, axonal sprouting. When you hear the word sprouting, think of plants growing new shoots. You may remember that neurons contain axons that help transmit information, but when an axon is damaged, its connection with other neurons is lost. Axonal sprouting is when undamaged axons sprout or grow new nerve endings to replace the old ones in order to reconnect to other neurons. Axonal sprouting can bridge the connection and so enable the communication in the brain to continue. Secondly, neuronal unmasking. The brain contains dormant synapses, dormant meaning it's alive but not active. These are connections between neurons which have no function. They are there, but they're not currently being used. When brain damage occurs, these dormant synapses become activated so that they can take on the function that was lost because of the brain damage. The neurons were there, but inactive, but now they are unmasked so that they are used to help recover the lost function. Thirdly, recruitment of homologous areas. The word homologous means similar. So this is where similar areas, sometimes in the other hemisphere, are used when an area of the brain is damaged. For example, if Broca's area was damaged on the left side of the brain, the right-sided equivalent would carry out its functions. For amazing examples of brain plasticity and the brain's ability to recover its function after trauma, consider these two cases. Firstly, there's the case of three-year-old Jodie Miller who we started the video with. She was having extreme seizures that were so frequent that the doctors were left with the option of removing her right hemisphere. So, what happened to her? Well, her brain started to rewire and reorganise itself. The functions and abilities that she'd learned and would have used her right hemisphere for were gone. But her left hemisphere took over these responsibilities. She's now a fully grown adult, married, and despite having some limited movement in her left side, if you met her, you probably wouldn't know that she only has half a brain. Life now with half a brain is, for me, is no different than anybody else. I've been married four years. I live on my own with my husband. I'm really glad my parents did what they did because I wouldn't be where I am now if I had had the surgery any later or had waited any longer. Secondly, there is the case study reported by Danelli et al. in 2013. They studied an Italian boy referred to as EB, who had most of his left hemisphere removed at age two and a half years because of a tumour. You may remember from a previous video on hemispheric lateralization that the left hemisphere is thought to be dominant for language. They studied EB up to the age of 14 and reported amazing results. Initially, he unsurprisingly had problems with language. However, within two years following the surgery, he had recovered most of his language skills. Over the years, his language was assessed as near to normal. When they scanned his brain with an fMRI machine, they found brain patterns for language tasks in the right hemisphere that you would typically find in the left hemisphere. The case of EB shows the plasticity of the brain following trauma, particularly the brain's ability to recruit homologous areas in the brain. In this case, the right hemisphere taking on the function of language, which is normally the responsibility of the left hemisphere. Now, it's important to note at this point that there are a number of factors that can affect how well the brain can recover its function after trauma. We're going to briefly consider three. Let's talk about the most obvious one based on what we've covered in this video. Age. What did you notice about the cases of Jody Miller and EB? They were both very young when they had their hemispheres removed, two and a half years and three years respectively. The younger you are, the more plastic the brain, 
and therefore the more likely you are to recover functions that you've lost following brain trauma. Secondly, education. Did you know that the more advanced your education is, the more likely your brain is to recover from trauma? That's right. Schneider et al. in 2014 found that the brains of patients with a university education showed greater recovery compared to those who didn't finish high school. One year after the brain injury, they were more likely to be disability free. And thirdly, gender. Ratcliffe et al. in 2007 examined the relationship between gender and cognitive recovery one year after traumatic brain injury. They studied 325 patients who were admitted to hospital within 24 hours of experiencing a traumatic brain injury. They assessed the patients on a range of cognitive abilities, including working memory, language and problem solving. What they found was that females performed significantly better than males on tests of attention and working memory after recovery, whereas the males outperform females in visual analytical skills. This would suggest that how well people can recover from brain injury can depend on the gender of the patient and what cognitive abilities have been affected by the trauma. Now just before we get to the test yourself questions, let me tell you about the next video in the biopsychology topic. We've talked about different studies that have looked at the brains of different patients, but what are the different ways that psychologists can study the brain and are some ways better than others? So in the next video, we're going to explore ways of studying the brain, which includes postmortems, fMRIs, EEGs and ERPs. To master that content, you can click the video link below. But now, it's time to check your understanding of what we've covered in this video. I'll present one question at a time, you can pause the video to answer it yourself first, and then press play again to reveal the answer. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.